so we're going to resume our recording and it is now noon so we are officially starting welcome all to our active learning faculty panel we are so happy to have you here today and i have some lovely esteemed colleagues that are going to support um, our active learning conversations throughout um, our panel time together and then of course um, we'll have a q and a session so um, our faculty panel members are as follows. Look at these lovely shots of our faculty panel here. So we're just going to have some brief introductions of um, our panel members. So to start off, my name is Christine Peacock. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for attending. I am an assistant professor in the College of Education and Social Services. Um, lead faculty here at the Tampa Education Center um, and uh, elementary education. So welcome everyone. And Laura Atfield, she is going to try to attend. Um, she was one of our panelists as well, but she had a conflict. So I put her on our faculty panel just in case she decides to join us a little bit later. And then next I'll introduce you to Michael Campbell, who's an associate professor in the College of Education and Social Services. So Michael, you're on. Uh, so just just a just brief context. I, I work in the graduate social work program, um, and uh, also the, the associate director in, in in that program. So looking forward to talking with you a little bit about how we use active learning strategies with our MSW students. Welcome everybody. Great, thank you, Michael. And now Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Delgado Brown. I'm in undergraduate education, and I'm the um, middle grades and secondary program administrator for our program. Thank you so much, Lisa. And then Tommy. Good afternoon, everyone. Tommy Humphreys. I'm in philosophy, theology, and religion. Thank you so much, Tommy and Patrick. Hello. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, good. I've got a new computer, so the speaker should work better than my last one. <laughs> That's always nice, right? Oh, it's very helpful when that works. So uh, I'm Patrick Sheridan. I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I teach organic chemistry. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick and Zachary. Good. Good morning, afternoon. Uh, my name is Zachary. I work in the College of Business, Finance, and Economics is what I teach. Awesome, Zachary, thank you so much. And then Tammy. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Tammy Zakelli. I am a professor of psychology and I teach a lot of different psychology courses. I'm not gonna bore you with the list, but um, it's good to see everyone. So thank you so much. Thank you for the introductions as well. Um, our panel is just fantastic. So when we got together initially to plan um, this active learning session, uh, there were so many strategies that our panelists were doing in the classroom or just started engaging in. So what we're going to do is talk about some of those strategies in the classroom. And, and some of you may have engaged in these strategies, like I said, and, and some of you, this may be new for you. So what we're going to do is share a little bit of how we've engaged our students in active learning. And so when we think about active learning, just a brief definition of it, we think about active learning as far as meaningful learning activities. So in thinking about active learning and some of the sessions and trainings that I've engaged in, I always thought about that sage on the stage versus that guide on the side. You know, what, what could that look like as far as me guiding my students along? And in an online learning environment, you know, that was a little tricky for me at first. Face-to-face, um, -face, it was, it seemed to be, um, a little more organic, I guess you can say, but in the online platform and hybrid platform, I really had to do some, some thinking about this and be very conscientious of these activities that I was planning. So I was thinking about that passive learning. What does it look like to, to be a passive learner and, and kind of put myself in the learner seat? And then I started thinking about student-centered learning. And so in the College of Education, uh, we talk often about student-centered learning and what we do with our K-12 learners to make that learning uh, meaningful and engaging. 
And so I started to kind of adopt that thinking and those philosophies into my own instruction. And I started to center my instruction more around that workshop method. And as I was speaking to the panelists, I started to uncover that most of our panelists and their strategies that they were using, utilizing, were more in that workshop format too. Their students were really engaging with learning through these activities. So I'm really excited for you all to, um, to kind of glean some insights on what that could look like in your classroom. And so that could be anywhere. And this is just a very short list from debates or discussions over a topic, collaborative problem solving through, through many different teaching and learning methods, conducting research to support a position or, a, or an idea, or, or like I said, just there's a plethora of strategies. And we're going to share those with you after our session. Seattle did a fantastic job in providing us some wonderful links to use in our classroom to engage our students in active learning. We're also going to share as a panel some of the face-to-face -face hybrid and online environments that we've utilized some of these strategies as well. So thinking about some of the topics to explore, when we had our pre-planning meeting, um, the various panel members had some expertise in some of these active learning methods or strategies or platforms. So we're gonna have Michael speak to whiteboards. Um, Lisa's going to talk about Flipgrid and interactive notebooks. Tommy's gonna talk about regular and asynchronous reading quizzes. Um, I'm going to share um, Office 365 and Google as far as like shared documents and, and their use in the classroom. Uh, Patrick's going to share Padlet for escape rooms, which is really exciting. Um, Zachary is going to share ThinkLink, it's an interactive platform for teaching and economics. And then Tammy is going to discuss paired debates. And so I am going to stop sharing my screen now. And we'll start with Dr. Michael Campbell with whiteboards. Thanks, Christine. Um, so I, I, sometimes I think it's helpful just for context. So uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Dr. Lee started off the MSW program um, using asynchronous and synchronous online learning. Uh, we don't have students in the classroom. So all of our teaching is done um, in a virtual context. Uh, many of our classes have, uh, well, all of our classes have at least one time, uh, one time a month, uh, and many of them, uh, 14 out of 16 weeks in, in the term where we have virtual sessions that run, uh, that, that run concurrently. So our, our students are pretty familiar with using Zoom. Um, and so what I thought I would do is talk with you guys about ways that we try and promote active learning in the MSW program using just one, uh, one strategy. So the MSW program uh, teaches students lots of different uh, content areas in the, uh, in the profession of social work, one of which is clinical practice. Uh, and one of the ways that counselors learn to hone their craft is through uh, role plays. So one of the challenges that you have in a virtual space is how do you create role plays that can be both authentic um, and meaningful. Um, and so we, 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 we really try and conduct a Zoom meeting for, as a role play where just the two uh, where the client and the clinician are present, or if it's more than uh, more than just one client, you know, multiple clients, families, cu couples, and the like, do the best we can doing a, a version of what tele uh, tele uh, therapies might look like uh, on a virtual platform, uh, and then afterwards we give them feedback. So I teach several sections of uh, individual practice uh, classes, and last night was an example. So we were we were uh, working on a, on a role play. Uh, two uh, two female students were meeting with one another um, to talk about issues around anxiety and and, and the like. And so uh, uh, so that's the the active learning strategy. Two two students doing role plays. I don't need to bore you. It, it would essentially look like Christine and I talking back and forth with one another. Functionally, is the is the effort. Um, the student gets a little bit of information as the clinician about the client. Uh, the client gets a much broader vignette. So that sort of state, sets the stage for it and they go back and forth in, in a 15 to 20 minute uh, exchange that's clinical in, in nature using a modality from, uh, from, from the class. The thing that I wanted to highlight for you, so, so that's one active learning strategy is, is the use of role plays and I'm uh, open to get feedback from you guys or questions from you guys about how we do that part of it. Um, the part that I found to be really interesting is, an, is the opportunity for feedback post, uh, post role play. Um, so trying to use some formative assessment strategies using whiteboard. So um, for those of you guys who raise your hand if you've used whiteboard in, um, in Zoom. 
I'm a handful. Okay, so I, I just want to show you what the whiteboard looks like. Uh, there's a whole lot of tutorials. I think uh, uh, Dan, does it, does Seattle have a, a, a tutorial for the use of a whiteboard in, in Zoom? Yes, we do. I was trying to find the mute button. Sorry. <laughs> Awesome. I know in the end we're gonna we're gonna give you guys a bunch of resources. So I just want you to see what it what, what it looks like if you shared if you shared a whiteboard in uh, in 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 Zoom. It's it's set up so that you can so that you can you can you can draw on it or you can uh, you, you can type text into it. And it's a it's a really quick and easy way for you to engage uh, engage students in a uh, in uh, in a dialogue. One of the one one of the advantages of it is that it, it it gives you a really quick sort of drop in. So you might have like a particular question that you want to ask students um, that's either provocative or uh, 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 or you want them to be thoughtful in in their responses. Um, what I've found is that whiteboards tend to be a really great medium for students who are peripherally uh, engaging verbally, um, uh, but really need time to think and articulate their their, their responses. So for the introverted thinker who, who, who engages in it and learns in a different strategy, using whiteboards gives them an arm um, versus the, a, a dialogue sort of uh, exchange um, for more verbal students is probably a preferred method for them. So using a whiteboard is a, is a really nice way to sort of pair uh, that learning. Um, for this particular class, I used a, a different whiteboard function and I, I wanna give the appropriate attribution. So Candace, did you teach me how to use line of it? In a, Okay. All right. Perfect. So, so this is. Uh, so, I'm going to do my best to try and uh, do justice to uh, Candace's uh, teaching me. And if I if I use this poorly, Candace, you'll you'll uh, you'll nudge me. Okay. Um, so, Lino, it looks like this. So, I think of it as a whiteboard, even though it's this one sort of looks like a cork board. Um, the, the, what's cool about it is it, it gives this background function for students to be able to engage. Um, in a topic. And so what I do in, in, in my class um, is I, I ask the students who are observing the role play to, to make note and, and think about feedback for the clinician or the counselor uh, that's appreciative. Or areas where they, where, where, where they excelled, either in the use of a specific modality, technique, question reframe, lots of different ways that you can give appreciative feedback about, about where, they, where they went, where they did really well, and then maybe opportunities for growth. So situations where the uh, where, where where the student may have an opportunity to uh, uh, to grow. So I'm gonna copy copy the um, so that link would take will take you to this uh, to to this whiteboard. Um, when when you click on that link over here in the top left hand corner, there's a, a post-it note. If you just click on it, and bring it over on, on the screen, and then you can. Type whatever your your feedback is, and then you post it. So I'm going to invite you guys to you guys if you want to put a post-it note on there, feel free. Um, it, it, one of the things that's nice for students so there's so there's a handful of uh, of pedagogical tools that I think Linoit serves in in this capacity. One, it's an on ramp for students who aren't necessarily verbal. Two, the right hand side is constructive feedback, which for some students may be hard for them to verbally say. You know, Dr. Campbell, I you know I, I noticed that you didn't really make great eye contact with your client. Uh, might be helpful for you to make good eye contact. We're, they may not be able to say that to me, but anonymously they can post that uh, content here on on the on the board. I have the ability on the back end to, to know who posted what. So if I have issues that are inappropriate, I have on my end because I own the board. I can you know eliminate uh, notes. I can you know so I can I have I have some control on the back end of it. Um, but there's but, but there's a lot of opportunity using this tool for students to share information, right? So we got we got Dory, we got some hellos, and it's the more that students use this, the more they can personalize it. They choose different colors for the post-it notes. They choose different color fonts. They, you know, somebody somebody got Dory in there, so you guys can figure this out. So it's relatively intuitive. Students do a great job with it. The last thing that I that, that I wanted to share was what it looks like when I. Um, when I offer this to students, what I what I do at the end of the of the class is I send the student an email with a link to the recording, and then I I just do a screenshot of the feedback that they receive. 
Um, this particular student wrote me back this morning saying thanks so much for it. She was really nervous doing the role play, as you guys might uh, um, assume that some students would be. So it's like the role play happens and it's just a blank slate for them. So they can go back and watch the recording and they can take a look at the feedback from their, from their colleagues and their peers. Uh, and then we do a check-in exercise at the end to ask them, you know, what did you see here in this feedback that you'd like to talk about? This particular student, there was, uh, there was th this, can you see my cursor moving? This particular notice about suicidal ideation for the for, for the client grew up a really great dialogue about how do you do lethality assessments for clients who have hi histories of depression? What were some of the uh, pieces of information, clinical information in it that might lead you to think about that? So we had a really rich conversation about, about suicidality and, and ways that we manage that with, uh, with, with clients. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and I'm going to take a look. Maybe there were some questions in there. Christine, you want us to just sort of yield and I'll just respond to questions in the chat room and move on to the next presenter? Yes, yes, that sounds great for the sake of time. So Michael, thank you so much. This was great. So I just want to ask you one question. When you when this was unfolding, these interactive whiteboards, and we know um, in Zoom, when you actually go to share your screen, there, there's actually that option to share what you actually have on your computer desktop or share a whiteboard. So with Zoom, that's a, that's a nice, you know, kind of a, um, a, a user-friendly way to, to access that whiteboard. So what issues did you experience, Michael? Just, you know, quickly, as far as um, maybe some challenges that you had initially with students in starting um, this type of active learning strategy. So some of you guys, when you got the link, you may have clicked on it and you can't figure out where, how, where is it? How do I... How do I write on it? If, you, if you're trying to use whiteboards in Zoom, there's a learning curve. Each one of these technologies, there's, there, there's a learning curve. So one of the things that, I, that I've experienced anytime I wanna switch gears to a new technology is I offer a low stakes uh, way for them to just play with the, with the technology so that ultimately the technology doesn't get in the way of their learning. Um, you know, like I'll, 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 if I'm going to use whiteboard, the Zoom whiteboard, I'll just drop a question in the middle of it that says, you know, what's your favorite cartoon character? And then, you know, I'll get Smurfette to Scooby-Doo. And, and then it's a, sort of a fun way for us to sort of playfully engage the medium. And then when I want to, you know, ask questions like, you know, you know, what, what is, uh, you, you know, what are some of the stigma uh, issues related to addiction in, um, in, in, you know, in, in society? that becomes obviously a much more prescient discussion. I want them to, I don't want the technology to get in the way of their ability to engage that conversation. And then typically I use the whiteboard as a jumping off point for a dialogue. And there tends to be more on-ramps that come from the, from, from the whiteboard for a verbal dialogue and discussion. That's great, Michael. Thank you so much. You know, I just, I, I heard you mention, you know, cognitive overload. Like we just don't want our students to experience that when they're learning a new digital platform. We want them to feel comfortable with it, right? And then bump that task or that prompt up in complexity. So, so that's that's fantastic. Um, thank you again for sharing it. Yeah, if you could address some of those questions. I, there were more comments. So, um, so, so very good feedback from the group. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have Dr. Lisa Delgado Brown. So, Lisa, if you'd like to um, share what you're doing in your classroom for active learning. Sure. Hi, all. Glad to be here today and talk about what some of the things that I'm doing. Um, so, I'm going to show you two um, different active learning strategies that I use. Uh, the first one is Flipgrid. Um, so, this is something um, that I use in my completely online courses. Um, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so one of the things that I do uh, with Flipgrid, and I started this last spring, I'm new to St. Leo, um, and I noticed that some of my online students just seemed a little um, not as connected, you know, and it was a strange year last year with COVID. Um, so in the spring, I started using um, Flipgrid, and it was very, help, or very helpful, I think, for building community um, in the classroom. This is a sample. This is one that I'm doing this semester. Um, but basically what I did was I converted all of our discussion boards over to Flipgrid. Um, so I just kind of went in and um, I went in and added those discussion boards. I just put the actual questions um, into the Flipgrid. 
so the students can go in and just answer those then they'll log in same you know setup as in our regular discussion boards they have till thursday to post their initial video and then when they post their initial video um, then students will um, log in and then respond underneath so I think it's been very helpful. I noticed that it really helps the students kind of feel more comfortable and confident in the topics that we cover in class. Um, there's not as much um, copying and pasting, you know, kind of that, uh, I don't know, sometimes it feels a little more dry sometimes in the discussion boards. And so I've really liked um, using them in my online courses. When I first started using it, there was a little bit of pushback. Um, I did have some students that did not um, want to be on video. And I just kind of kept reiterating that I thought it would help them over the course of the semester. Um, and I got really good feedback um, in my spring course where I did that. Um, they gave me really good feedback. Um, you know, and said that it really had helped them feel more comfortable. Several of the students um, that came from different centers said it really helped them feel a little more connected overall to different students in different platforms and, you know, different locations. So that was, that was really good to hear. Um, they seem to like it. One of the things that I do um, just to make it more accessible is just with MD2L, um, you know, where you've got your modules, I'll just put the actual Flipgrid code. So if they forget, if they go into D2L, if they prefer to access it that way, then they can just click the Flipgrid code and then it'll take them automatically to the Flipgrid page. Lisa, um, and I, I love that you've included that in your D2L discuss, discussion module for student access. That is wonderful. Yeah, I find it's helpful. And, you know, the first couple of weeks, it seems like I still have a few stragglers that maybe haven't read the, the notes or the announcements, or maybe they're hoping that if they just keep posting in D2L, that I'll, I'll let it go. Um, so I just, you know, kind of go on and say, oops, remember all the discussion posts for this class are on Flipgrid and I'll redirect them. Um, so it's gone pretty well. Um, so that's, that's what I did with Flipgrid. And then let me show you one of my other classes. Um, this was a spring course that I did as well. Um, and so one of the things that I did, um, this is an adolescent literacy course that I was teaching. I had a lot of students um, in education that had some personal technology goals. Um, so I knew they were trying to build on these skills um, themselves in the classroom. And so what I did is I decided we would use interactive journals. So we used Google Slides as our platform. And basically what I did was each week I had a template for the students and we would have the template in class. And then I would go over what my expectations were. So like, for example, um, I just had it within my slides, what we were gonna do for the night. And then I had a section in class um, where we would go over um, what we were going to do for the that week so i would have readings that i had them do and they were usually research based um, so sometimes a little more dry you know just kind of depending on what we were going over and so i really wanted them to do something fun and engaging and make sure that they were reading right because that's one of the pieces sometimes they don't always read those assigned materials so i wanted to um you know make sure that they were processing what they were doing so i would have a slide had the google docs link and the directions and so they would just click on that Google Docs link, they could save it because I used that same, um, you know, slide show each week. And so if they had it marked on their computer, they didn't even have to use that, but that was an easy way to use it in class. And so then once they click link, each week there was a different template. So kind of like what you were saying, Michael, I started them off slow. So the first week, for example, it was a pretty basic one. Um, so this one, it was something I called strikes and wonders. So they would just have to give some strikes, which were important points that they found in the article, and then any questions that they had. And I set it up a blank slide at the beginning so they could just right click and then duplicate the slide and then they could put their information. So the beginning of the slideshow had all of the blank slides that they could access. And so those were free templates that I found um, online a lot of times, things were easy to use. And then I used these um, dividers within there, within the slideshow, so they could easily find where they were supposed to put stuff for that week. And then they would add their slides in with their information. Um, 
you know, it just kind of got a little fun. This one was a comic book template. And so each group, for example, on that week, they had an article that they had read. Um, they'd read two or three for the week. And they would just, each group would take it and respond to it and kind of make it their own. Um, on this one, these were the students were talking about alternative uh, reading um, activities that they can do in class. And, you know, I just thought they had a lot of fun. You know, here was their response. Um, you know, they were responding to the article about how, you know, it would feel monotonous if they, um, you know, weren't including some of these strategies in their classroom. Um, but that after they included those strategies, their students would be so excited, you know, and so they used these um, templates. Um, in class and they all just did, you know, very different things with them. So that was um, very fun. I had a couple of weeks that I wanted to highlight. Um, week four, we did these infographics. So again, this was a template I found online. The base of the um, activity was there, but then they went in and they added their own graphics or, you know, they could kind of jazz up what they were writing and how it looked. Um, so each group's platform just, you know, took on a little bit of a different um, tone and it was related to the activities or the readings that we were doing in class. Um, and so I had some different ones. We had a lot of students that really liked Canva. Um, and so they used that. That was a great free platform. Um, and then let's see, week six, we did a text or image collage summary. So they did some fun um, and interesting things. And then when they would put it together, um, they would share it out. Um, with the group and kind of explain some of their images. So it just kind of gave them a really nice platform um, to be able to kind of explore some of the technologies they could then turn around and use in their classrooms. I tried to be intentional too um, in terms of grouping. So I used a lot of uh, mixed grouping over the course of the semester. So the students weren't always paired with the same students because I didn't want that situation to evolve where the one student was the creator of the slide. Um, so I kind of varied their roles. And so that really helped. And I felt like a lot of the students um, had gained a lot of um, experience over the course of the semester. They really liked it. And again, it was another thing they were really gave me good feedback on on the course evaluations at the end of the semester. Lisa, this is this is great. This is <laughs> active learning. These interactive journals. This is this is a great activity strategy in thinking about the online um, hybrid and and face to face formats. Right, students can can actually access these just like um, just like they did with um, Michael's um, as far as your whiteboards are concerned. So so these are great strategies that can transfer to those different modalities. Um, we have a question, Lisa, about the difference of using Flipgrid from using the tools in the discussion box, if any. So are you able to answer that question while I set up? All right, so the, the question um, was what tools did I use in Flipgrid? So what's the difference from using Flipgrid and then I guess tools in the discussion box? Um, is in the discussion box, Lisa, you have the option of choosing to insert your response to the discussion as a video or an audio. So I'm, I'm just curious to know, I've never used Flipgrid because I always use the video option in the discussion and then the video appears inside the, dis the discussion box and then you know, we can respond to a video with another video, but all of those tools are already in the discussion box versus using, I'm assuming Flipgrid is an out, an external tool. So I'm, I was just wondering if there was a difference and if, if Flipgrid is easier than using the discussion box tool or vice versa, I'm not sure. That, that's a great question, Georgina. I'm, I haven't used the discussion board tools in Flipgrid, so I can't answer that piece. Um, it is a Microsoft platform, um, but it syncs easily with with our tools, um, and so it's it's pretty user friendly. Uh, if you're already familiar with using it in, you know, the discussion board, you may not find that much of a difference. Um, but I, the students have reported that they like it just because it. Um, you know, it's kind of engaging. It does show on the top, it gives like a uh, printout. You can put it in an Excel, an Excel spreadsheet too and kind of get your statistics. So I like that piece. I don't know if D2L does that, um, but it also shows how many hours of engagement 
So those are some nice features. I'm not sure if, again, if those are in the D2L platform, but. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but definitely those extra tools would be a benefit. I, you know, I just started using oral presentations of discussion questions on the discussion board, but using the tool that's embedded within the discussion box. Um, and I wanted to mention that my students are semi-reluctant to, to show their face on video. So I make one of them optional, but then I say, if you don't choose to do it or practice this time around, then when you when week eight comes around, you're gonna have to do it. So I would suggest you practice. And I always have students in the middle of the term say, well, could I do this one, even if it's another discussion question that wasn't meant or designed to be oral? And I give them the opportunity because that's kind of like their practice run so that when they go to the one that's required, they're prepared. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, there's some really fun and tools that they can use in Flipgrid too. They can take selfies. Um, they have like different features where they can create borders and put uh, sticky notes on there. So some of those features are just kind of a fun piece. Um, the students in this class this semester haven't really used them much, but um, in my spring course, they did a lot. And so they were always decorating their pictures when they were posting them, so. Great, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Georgina. Also, you know, when we think about you know, these different modalities of answering discussion topics, connecting to, you know, the readings and um, making meaning and actually assessing, being able to formatively assess our learners and, and are they understanding what they're reading? These, these platforms are great. I, I really like the use of, of Flipgrid because students are able to record themselves and that kind of taps into a different experience for them, doesn't it? They have to be prepared. The answers are a little more authentic um, than like Lisa said, the possible copying and pasting that could occur. Um, the, their answers are a little more meaningful um, when they are discussing and then that interaction happens, which is building the culture within the classroom. So um, thank you both so much. So connected to that, I'm going to discuss briefly shared documents. And so how I utilize shared documents, I use Office 365 and Google for shared documents. With Google, um, students have to have a Google Gmail account. So if they don't have one, they'll have to just sign up for it pretty easily. And, and Lisa, I think you experienced some of that with um, your interactive notebook. Students had to create that account. Is that right? Okay, yep, so, so quick creation of an account doesn't take much time at all, but St. Leo does have the Office 365, which is um, just as user-friendly as Google. And so my students would work in groups or in partnerships exploring a, a topic or answering a question related to um, the readings connected to either research or practitioner-based readings. Uh, that student work, one of the benefits is that student work is captured in real time. So I'm able to formatively assess and know where the learners are at that moment. And then students are able to look at each other's work. They're able to look at peer work in real time and just kind of get that peer insight, you know, kind of that by got seen perspective of looking at others' work and seeing, oh, maybe I should do that, or just getting some insight as to something different that they can compose or just getting some ideas from their peers based on what's happening in real time. So I really like that it's captured in real time. And so thinking about that, um, it's very easy to access these shared documents. So you just go to your apps and, and if you're in your email or whatever drive you are, you can get to your apps very quickly in 365. And then just click on either PowerPoint or Word or Excel, whatever document you want the students to share. And like I said, very similar to Lisa, you would just click on the share, copy the link and post it. Uh, what I do is post it right in my PowerPoint so that the students have it in the PowerPoint. And then I copy and paste that link and I put it right in the chat. So when I put the students in their breakout rooms, they all have that chat link, they all access it and they're able to get online and all have the same document in front of them with a different purpose, of course. So it's more often I use PowerPoint um, than I do any of the others because I like for students to create you know, their slides together in partnerships or groups. Um, but I have used Word documents for co-constructing essays and, and so that's been very helpful too. And then just as Michael said, it kind of gives the students that safe space, you know, to, to um, assess understanding and, and to try something new or to say something um, without feeling, um, you know, a little inferior about it. So I've, I felt that students um, felt that it was a safe space also to 
compose some of their, um, their thoughts. And so in Google, it would be the same thing. You would click on um, the waffle in the top right corner, just as you would with 365, and then share docs or slides. So um, both very similar to 365. And then here are some of the, the um, shared uh, documents that we did very similar to Lisa and Michael. I had students just, you know, they were having a difficult time cropping images and putting them into the slides. And we do a lot of visual imagery in my class and, and one picture or one visual image to describe what you're thinking or what the text is saying. So we do a lot with that. And so um, students really have to think in these kind of critical complex, um, kind of synthesizing the information when grabbing a picture. So we just had this simple, um, let's go ahead and just, you know, in my social studies course, let's go ahead and, and crop some images or find some images and show, I was able to show them how to insert images through this um, very simple task of renewable resources and then um, non-renewable resources. And so they just had some experience with just kind of cropping and putting images in. So, so that was helpful to have just a very low stakes task connected to some of these technological um, shifts that some of them were experiencing because I, I do have quite a bit of non-traditional students who haven't been in school in quite some time. So even opening a PowerPoint and saving it to the desktop was um, a learning curve. So um, this was another, so in my science course, so we actually had groups of students um, demonstrating their understanding of the body systems. And so coming up and creating this one really got a little froggy with their images in the background, which is great. Um, and so this is just a way as they're composing, I'm actually looking at them um, in real time. I'm taking my notes. I bring them all back from the breakout groups and, and we discuss, I'll share this and we discuss in real time um, what's going on. Sometimes I'll, I'll create um, uh, comments in the comment section. Um, other times I, I crop and kind of move pictures around to give them a little more room so they see what I'm doing. And oftentimes they'll thank me for that because they, they feel like they're stuck. So, so this is just a little bit of shared documents. And like I said, a very, very easy platform to use with um, your student and, and provides that active learning strategy um, for students, especially you know in teaching in the Zoom um, hybrid online format. So that's uh, just a little bit with shared documents and now we're going to have our next presenter which is uh, Dr. Thomas Humphrey. So Tommy you're going to talk, talk about regular asynchronous reading quizzes. So I'm going to stop sharing Tommy and give you the screen. Tommy actually had class at 1240 so he had to run. Oh darn okay well thank you so much. So next we have uh, Patrick shared in Padlet for escape rooms. Oh, hello, hi everybody. Okay, give me one second. I've happily not used Zoom for a long time. Uh, okay, so are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, I also don't have like four monitors with me, so it sort of limits which panel I have to look at. So it's, it's confusing sometimes. Okay, so, uh, when the pandemic hit last, and we were in last spring, uh, you know, during lecture, what I normally do is uh, I don't use PowerPoint, I'd use Notability, and I would sketch out all my molecules and the reactions, and the students would sketch with me, and we had a conversation about content, and occasionally I had little activities, like the students would, uh, I'd ask them to solve some problems that I'd put on the little screen or the board, but I'd had an activity like bingo, and uh, I did a Jeopardy game with them on PowerPoint. So little activities to bring them into the conversation to sort of suss out you know, what they truly understood and where the problem points were. And I had joined a group on Facebook. Is everybody okay? You can hear me? Yes. Okay. And so it's a strategies for teaching chemistry online. And one of the topics that was thrown around was the idea of a breakout room. And so folk would put together a breakout room on like a, a Google document where they would share a, a simple piece of paper if they were in the classroom together face to face. And I thought, well, I've been using Padlet for problem sets for a while. Maybe I just try to create an escape room on the Padlet. And so last spring, I used this during my laboratory time. So for us, for lab times, we have three hour blocks to work with students, which is really nice. And so last semester, uh, it's a bit different than what I organized for this semester, but I had 40 minute blocks that I could partition for groups of four to five students. 
And so what I did was uh, you're seeing a breakout room information uh, panel there. Give me one second. Pop back up. Ah, there we go. I moved up top. I'm going to drop the link in there so you can pull this up on your own screen if you want to. And so what I did was I told the students, hey, we're going to have this little review activity that's a breakout room. They're okay. And I solicited opinions for a sort of theme for this. And they all really liked Harry Potter. And what I did was I set up this page where I gave them information about what we were going to do. So in the first column there, I told them the dates that we would have the lab experience. We do the breakout room stuff. Next column, I told them, hey, find a few friends in class you want to work with. We're going to set you up as a group. I told them they're going to have this 40 minute block to work through the content. And then in one, two, three, four, the fourth column the, uh, with the escape room themes, I modeled all these different themes that they could choose. So the group could pick whichever uh, room they'd want, Gryffindor, Slytherin, the Goblet of Fire. And I also gave them the heads up as to the particular content that would be on their page and the problems they'd have to try and solve and work together to understand. Uh, and so they would sign up on a Google document about a week in advance. So I knew who would have to be there uh, at the right time to join the room and participate in the activity. And I also shared a, a funny uh, Harry Potter parody with the dark word funk you up uh, so they could listen to the music. And so when the time came for the students to uh, join the Zoom room, what I would do is uh, I'd get the group together and I'd take them to this new room. So I'll, I'll share this in the chat box. Da -da -da -da. Da -da. The other link. And so I would bring the group to this room. Okay. Now in this room, you have all of the possible escape rooms you could choose from. So there's Gryffindor, Slytherin, Ravenclaw, Ministry of Magic, et cetera, et cetera. All these cool options. And each room has slightly different problems. Once the students chose their room, I would share the link on the screen on the Padlet page and I would pull it up and I would share the link with them. So everybody's on Zoom. And so what we do is, for instance, if they wanted to be Gryffindor, I'd give them the Gryffindor link, I'd pull this up and they could pull it up on their computers or their iPad or their phone, whatever they want to do. And so once we arrive at the room, I've got some more extra information just uh, to reiterate the rules of the escape room. And so on the left column, you have the instruction column, just as a reminder. Uh, I have a map that I created. So if you click on the image over here, it tells you these applets out of the way where we're going to start. So we start with the history of magic. Then we, if you answer this correctly, you are permitted to continue on. And you escape the room when you've gone all the way through this a series of questions and you get to station eight, which is freedom, expecto patronum. Okay? So you must do the history of magic and answer that. When you complete it, then you're permitted to move to the next column, which is the new station. But here you get to pick one, do potions or charms, get it correct, move on to muggle studies. So throughout this whole sequence, uh, they get to collaborate. They're talking with each other over Zoom. I'm the guide on the side, trying to take what they're saying to sort of help them to see how to approach getting to the correct answer. And sometimes to get it right off the bat, that's great. Uh, they are allowed to use the whiteboard. They can use Notability as well, because a lot of us take our notes on the Notability app. So we're very comfortable with sharing the screens and the PDFs and things like that. Uh, they can also, what they do is because this is a Padlet and we have to draw molecules, what they would do is they'd write their notes on the paper, their notebook, take a picture of it and post it right to the Padlet column. So then we can discuss it. Now, when I'm done with this, I can PDF the entire page and look at all the results, add comments. I PDF at Notability so I can add my comments to help guide them. If they were struggling with an area, I give them some more information and how they might want to approach problem solving. For some of these problems, I also give them a guide handout so they can look at the questions and scroll through and say, oh, okay, I need to know. I need that bond. They see double bond O. If I see it at this location, I know I have that in my molecule. So there are little guides and things along the way. But uh, it's pretty cool. They really enjoyed the themes. They were really aggressive. They were very vocal with trying to like, like get out like what they thought about the problem, what the answer might be. Uh, once we'd get to the end and they'd solve the last problem, one of the questions first out of their mouths was, uh, were we the only ones that escaped the room? It's like, did, did everybody else fail? I mean, they were really just gung-ho about it. So, so this is, they, they really had a great time and I think because of the theme and the intimate environment of just a few students and me helping them, the typically uh, shy students, they opened up more and they were willing to try to, you know, 
join the conversation and contribute something. If they, even if they didn't know the answer right off the bat, you know, we work through it. Uh, so there's lots of these options, lots of these rooms, a uh, chance for everybody to get engaged. Uh, I even had one, uh, Merlin's Keep. Uh, it's actually, I sourced the characters from some books and things that I like for uh, wizards and stuff. So some of them are on TV and such. And so they can just click on these images and they can come up and it, it's pretty cool. Now this was in the spring where I had uh, a lot of time and we had plenty of uh, you know, opportunities to work through the problems. There's like four students, 40 minutes, and that was great. But that's not really optimum for most other people with different classes. You can't just devote 40 minutes of class time to working with just so few students. But I did it with mine because I really wanted to, them to get through the content and we used it as an exam review. Uh, because in the spring, when they take their final exam, it's cumulative, it's organic one and two. So a lot of these problems try to connect things that we had been talking about all along and reinforce these ideas so they didn't hit the final exam and say, oh my God, I get nothing. You know, so it's little ideas here and there that we sort of cobbled together to master the content. So with that in mind, uh, this semester, I sort of used this idea of the breakout room in my lecture. And so what I did was I made uh, a new style of breakout room. And I'll share this with the little chat box if you want to pull it up. Where did it go? Where are you all? Ah, yeah. So I'll, I'll share this guy here. So for lecture, I made it uh, more compact. Get all these screens out of the way. And so what I did was uh, the students would sign up and join a group. Uh, they knew who they wanted to work with in advance. And uh, once we were ready for this in lecture, I would then bring up the page on the smart board and I would send the link to the classroom uh, to all the students and they could go to their particular column. And in order to escape it, they just had to solve the problems. So for instance, here it's smaller groups, uh, three or four students, they have 10 minutes and they have three problems in each column. And so the goal is you must answer two of the three completely incorrectly for you to get the points. And it's only four bonus points, but it's only four, but they were so competitive. Like, give me my points. I want to earn my points. Did I earn my points? Was everything correct? Uh, they just really tore into it. And so again, you know, I've got a new theme. I went from Harry Potter. They love Marvel. Uh, next up, I'm going to try to work some novels and poets in here. And you can just design the theme, you know, however you like it. Uh, whatever content you want, you can tailor the problems to your uh, area of expertise. It was just a lot of fun. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, yeah, uh, any questions? Hopefully I didn't go over time. I agree, Zach. He should have an hour long for his, <laughs> for his presentation. I, I put in the chat box, Pat Patrick, that I want a one-on-one -on -one personal consultation. <laughs> Please. Okay. No problem. So uh, I use Padlet. I use Padlet, but not this extensive. Yeah. See, I, I really once I started with it. Uh, let me just say, you know, Padlet, you get free Padlets, like three of them. But if you want to design more than three Padlets, you pay 10 bucks a month. So I probably have on my account, like over 120 Padlet pages, problems, breakout rooms, connection sites, you name it. So once I just said, you know, let's just run with it. Uh, I, I spent some hours at night finding the, the logos, the pictures, putting together the individual problems. And so like the big problem set that I ran last year, I was very careful to share the links only with the group. And once we were done, I changed the link and I deleted it from the main page. So they couldn't share uh, specific examples with the other students. So like you're sort of on your own, you've got your basic uh, set of knowledge and you have to figure out how to apply it to your unique problems. And these problems are all ones that I created. I don't get them from a database or a textbook or something. So it's really, they can't cheat. They can't go to Chag or some other site. So it's, it's really, what can you do? And they really loved it. It worked out well. I, I love the connection to pop culture. Um, and, and I wanted to say, you know, each of those who have presented so far today, you could do a whole hour um, presentation. And so you have a couple options here. Um, one is we'll, we'll host another uh, webinar anytime. Um, including anybody that we don't get to today, because I know it looks like we're running short and I don't want those to have like three minutes and not be able to finish up. So I'll leave that up to Christine and the committee, you all to decide, you know, how you're going to handle that. But um, we can always schedule more, definitely for those we didn't get to today, but then we could do more individual ones with only one or two people. 
Um, but also faculty development day, we have a strand in faculty development day for active learning. And honestly, I would encourage every one of you to apply for that. Even if, if you don't want the whole hour, you could share it with somebody and, you know, do a call, you know, submit your proposal for that. But please think about that. We sent out another reminder on the call for proposals. It's really simple to fill out. It won't take you a ton of time. And I just think we need a bigger, broader audience for this because you all have, are really presenting some terrific stuff. Candace, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, the panel knows that I've been saying we need to present our work at Faculty Development Day, and I've just been uh, kind of hitting them with that too. So, um, so yes, I, you know, some of these could be their own session for sure. So, uh, so, so yeah, we are definitely considering that, um, Candace for Seidel, absolutely, and um, and I'm sure you'll be getting quite a few proposals um, after this session. So, so thank you so much, and. Um, Patrick, you know what, what I loved, um, and, and with all of the panelists, is that you really showcase and capture how your learning as an instructor has involved as well, right? So it's not just, you know, being the expert here and producing this, like you, you've evolved, you know, as well. Very true. And, yes, and, and that can be painful at times, right? <laughs> 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 yes, and so so stretching ourselves, but then look at this amazing products, you know, these products we all have with our students. So um, I think we have time for, uh, we have uh, Dr. Zachary Smith and Dr. Tammy uh, Zakeli. So I'm not quite sure how we want to work that. I, I could give you all just a, a few minutes um, to just kind of showcase um, what you were thinking, and then we'll, we'll do a quick Q&A and uh, share some of those last slides so um or we are we are happy to schedule another one so really it's up to you all i don't want you to feel shortchanged, and i know you've got good stuff so if you'd like us to reschedule we can do that if one of you wants to go or if you just want to give a quick we'll do whatever you want thank you so much candace so so let's hear from next person, uh, Dr. Zachary Smith. What do you think? Would you like to share a bit? Or I could just, I could just go really quick. Um, during the summer, what I wanted to do or, or, or what I felt like I needed to do for my class was to kind of change the engagement a little bit. I teach macroeconomics. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes. So I teach macroeconomics. It's, it's, it's sometimes known as the dismal science. I wanted to make it transition from the dismal science to something more approachable. So I integrated like data visualization, some coding, but also I wanted to reach out to the marketers in our in our business schools, the communication majors in our business school and, and other majors, allow them to be creative in their presentations. So so what I did is I, I took macro global and instead of doing the quizzes that we did at the end of the chapters before, we, we transitioned to a project in this particular course. And I just want to show Maybe maybe one or two. Um, the first, just an example of, of of the student kind of. So all of these dots on this map are student presentations, and in each of these dots are eight presentations of eight different topics as you go through modules throughout the term. So it's a it's a topic by topic um, presentation. But but here's an example of kind of what you get from from one student, and and I'm going to play two of these maybe. It's a short one, but. You got these, these um, I don't know what they're, they're um, infographics. They do an infographic. They got a bunch of different information about, this is human capital index in this particular case. And each student has to give a presentation of, of about one to one and a half minutes. So this is Jorge explaining the human capital index in Ecuador. Well developed, Ecuador has a 0.59 out of one. Uh, in the human capital index and as you can see in the graph we don't stand too well uh, compared to other countries so there's a lot of poverty in ecuador the 25 percent of the whole population uh, lives under poverty that's why uh, there's a lot of kids that suffer from malnutrition the 23 percent out of all kids under the age of five suffer from malnutrition so the expected years of, of schooling it's at 14.6 but I, at the age of 10 25 percent of all the kids that were enrolled in primary school are dropped out so the population with at least some secondary education, it's at 0 0.53 out of one, basically half of the population. And that's why only we, don't have, we only have the 0 0.47 of a skilled labor force. Uh, there's a lot of gender inequality and one 
I guess f- from that from that you should kind of get get the feel of what they're doing. Um, they're they're presenting their individual country, whatever that country is. I have one one more quick example, and I'll just illustrate really quick a more a humorous one. So so they get to tell their personalities in these different presentations. So this one's uh, this 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 Don, and he's talking about Pakistan, and his presentation is a little more humorous. But it's still great. Good morning, everyone. I'm still going. It is 7:14 a.m. And today, unemployment in Kazakhstan. Total population of only 19 million people. Kazakhstan has a labor force of 8.7 million people. Who cares about numbers and rates and all that kind of stuff? official statistics are <laughs> interesting because the recent government is very corrupted and controls all the media. So the statistics that you might see on the internet may not be true. Because, for example, this one source says that even though official statistics of unemployment rate is 5.2% in Kazakhstan, in reality, it might be 35 or even more, but we can't know for sure. It might be five, it might be 35, it might be even 50%. But Palestine doesn't have proper tools and not professionals to determine it properly. So for now, we're clueless. So so that that's pretty much it. So so they go through go go through the semester. They give me a, a minute and a half to two minutes of a presentation each module. That that kind of gives us eight mini presentations. At the end, they got their presentation, their grade. I think it's an interesting way to expand macroeconomics globally. And that's it. I'll leave a little bit of time for our next speaker. Thank you so much, Zachary. That that's just fantastic. You know, we the members of our group didn't know about um, Thing Link, and so after seeing what Zachary has done to to um, provide his students with some active engagement strategy in macroeconomics, which can be a little dull, he noted at times. I mean, this is just this was just fantastic. So, thank you so much for sharing that and um, thing link. Um, and to Tammy, um, Dr. Tammy Zakeli, I, I don't know if you have you know just a minute or two to just share about your paired debates, um, but I'll yeah, I'll I can. I can try just to give you like kind of a brief overview because I had like some slides and things like that, but that's okay. Um, So basically this, my presentation is actually very low tech compared to what we've been seeing. And what I would say is like in psychology and other fields, there's a lot of opportunities to discuss topics which can be controversial. So what I have done in um, face-to-face classes is I have these paired debates. We have a controversial topic. It could be spanking. It could be um, causes of addiction. You know, I have like a whole list of different things. Immunizations, which has been very popular right now, you know, but when I first started, it was just childhood immunizations, but this was my first semester having that conversation, you know, after COVID and everything has been going on. So what I do is um, for in class, there's a handout that they get and I do randomly assign them, you know, one, two, one, two, and, you know, ones might agree, two might disagree. They get a statement in bold on the top of their handout and they have to answer some questions first. So they need to do a little bit of research first. Personal experiences are okay, but I do encourage them to look up information as well. And one of the recent ones we also did was like gun safety in the home, like who's responsible if a child kills or injures a person with a gun. So, you know, that's one. And so just a variety of different topics. And so when COVID happens, and also while I was also doing um, online course development, I was like, how am I going to have this still work in this new environment? And it actually does work really well. So in an online class only, um, a discussion forum is how I've set it up. So the instructor or me, who's ever in charge of that class at that time, will go ahead and assign, you know, here's our agrees, here's our disagrees. They answer the questions, they go into the discussion forum, and I have them each do like their opening statement. And then I want them to at least respond to each other two more times. So it's kind of like they're 
somewhat debating. So in an online class, they might have a few days to kind of go through the debate, whereas in class, I give them about 10 minutes total. So it doesn't take up a lot of class time because they're already answering the questions first, then they're debating. And then when we're in class, we come back as a larger class to go through the questions um, together. Now in the hybrid format, I was able to have, you know, some students talked in the classroom, some I put into breakout rooms. And so either way you look at it, you're still able to do the activity. And I think it's really good because it fosters respect for these diverse perspectives because you're being randomly assigned. So you may or may not be on the side that you agree with. And it you know, fosters community as well because they're talking to each other, they're learning from each other. So that's paired debates in a nutshell. And hopefully for <laughs> faculty development day, I can tell you more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tammy. That's so You're welcome. Good. You know, I'm so glad that you actually shared um, paired debates because, you know, active learning doesn't have to be this big technological um, platform, this large platform. It can actually be some of those strategies in the classroom where, you know, through oral and written discourse, you're having your students engage in an interactive way to make meaning of the content. So one of the common themes before we wrap up is that, you know, I did notice through um, the presentations that there was this formative assessment theme uh, with um, real time learning and intervening in real time through these active learning strategies. And I also noticed that um, these are safe spaces for students to really engage with the topics or the content. We know our summative assessments may not be very active at all. Uh, some may, but generally they're not as active. So providing some of these active strategies to facilitate the learning and uh, impact you know, conceptual understanding at a deeper level is really helpful so that when it comes time for those formative, those summative assessments, students are able to perform well. And so um, we have CETL resources that I wanna share with you. Thank you for the extension on the one minute. Um, we do have active learning. CETL has an active learning web um, site with amazing resources. And then of course, the mini tech grants, don't forget those. Um, those are actually um, connected and can be connected to a lot of these active learning platforms that we share today. So thank you so much all. Really appreciate your time, taking your lunch time out to learn about active learning and, and hopefully we will see you during faculty development day. Yeah, thanks again, everybody who presented. And uh, if you didn't have a chance to present or you wanna present longer or more like Candace said earlier, we're happy to accommodate that as many times as you like. So uh, <laughs> just let us know. Um, I posted a few of those links that link to the mini tech grants uh, in the chat and a link as well to our, oh, there was something else that I put in there now. I can't remember on top of my head. Active learning. Yeah, faculty development day um, proposals, the application for that, or, and uh, a link to Patrick did a base camp for us back in the spring of this year on his, uh escape rooms phenomenal uh he got into a lot more detail than he was able to today so if you're interested check that out and patrick of course please come do it again for us we'd love to have you um i think karen's got a survey are you were you going to put that in the chat now and email it or do you want to just email it since we lost a few of our participants how do you want to do that uh, it's in there so yes if you're if you're uh, well if you're a panelist you're more than welcome to take your take the survey but um anyone that's attending if you'd like to go ahead and complete the survey for us and yes so those that were not able to that did um, um end up having to leave we'll go ahead and email them give them the opportunity to partake in the survey so thank you thank you thank you you all knocked it out of the park that was Absolutely. really awesome i i can't wait to try some of these things uh,